The 8,980th meeting of the Security Council's call to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is letter from the Permanent Representative of Ukraine to the United Nations dated 28 February 2014 addressed to the President of the Security Council, document S-2014-136. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of Item 2 of the agenda. Members of the Council have before them document S-2022-160, the text of a draft resolution submitted by Albania and the United States of America. The Council is ready to proceed to the vote on the draft resolution before it. I shall put the draft resolution to the vote now. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2022 slash 160, please raise your hand. I request that those who are voting, I request that those who are against the resolution raise their hand. Abstentions, kindly raise your hands. The result of the voting is as follows, 11 votes in favor, one vote against, three abstentions. Given, in line with established procedure at the Security Council, this matter and this vote was procedural in nature, the draft resolution is now deemed to be adopted as Resolution 2623-2022. I now give the floor to those members of the Council who wish to make statements after the vote. And I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Colleagues, <clears throat> on Friday night, we stood together outside this chamber to declare that the Russian veto would not stop us from holding Russia accountable for invading a sovereign state, a state that dared to be a democracy. Russia vetoes fr vetoed Friday's resolution, but as I have said before, Russia cannot veto our voices Russia cannot veto the Ukrainian people, and Russia cannot veto the UN Charter. Russia cannot and will not veto accountability. Now the Security Council has taken an important step forward toward that accountability. For the first time, for the first time in decades, it has called for an emergency special session in the General Assembly. The council members who supported this resolution recognize that this is no ordinary moment. We need to take extraordinary actions to meet this threat to our international system and do everything we can to help Ukraine and its people. Just this morning, President Putin put Russia's nuclear forces on high alert. Even though he is invading a country with no nuclear weapons and is under no threat from NATO, a defensive alliance that will not fight in Ukraine. This is another escalatory and unnecessary step that threatens us all. We urge Russia to tone down its dangerous rhetoric regarding nuclear weapons. These are issues that affect all member states. And now in the General Assembly, they can all make their voices heard on Russia's war of choice. We will then vote on a resolution that will hold Russia to account 
for its indefensible actions and for its violations of the UN Charter. As we speak, rockets continue to rain down on Kyiv and across Ukraine. Tanks are tearing through cities. Russia readies still more brutal weaponry. Bombs that flatten cities and indiscriminately target civilians for an unjustifiable assault fabricated out of lies and the rewriting of history. Russia also propagates outrageous lies about Ukraine's conduct in its own defense. We are alarmed by the mounting reports of civilian casualties, videos of Russian forces moving exceptionally lethal weaponry into Ukraine, and the widespread destruction of civilian facilities like residences, schools, and hospitals. To the Russian officers and soldiers, I say, the world, will, the world is watching. Photographic and video evidence is mounting, and you will be held to account for your actions. We will not let atrocities slide. Those of us here, safely sitting in this hallowed hall, have a moral responsibility to respond to Russia's desecration of human life. That means humanitarian aid, like the thermal blankets USAID has already airlifted to tens of thousands of Ukrainians in need, and the recently announced $54 million in additional humanitarian assistance that will reach hundreds of thousands more. That means military support including the additional $350 million of security assistance the United States is shipping to Ukraine. And it means holding the sole aggressor, Russia, accountable for its actions. That will take some courage from some fellow member states, and I know that. They have shown strength by the inspiration I I would like to stress for the inspiration, I would ask you to look to the Ukrainian people. They have shown strength, courage, and resilience in the face of Russian guns and soldiers and bombs and rockets. They also maintain the courage to sit down and talk. We welcome their continued willingness to participate in peace talks. On Friday night, darkness descended on Kyiv Missiles attacked a sheltering city. But the next morning, Ukrainians woke up to a new citizen, a baby girl born to a mother in a bomb shelter. The baby's name is Mia. Photos of her tiny hand gripping her mother as they hid underground have inspired the world. Let us have the courage of Mia's mother let us have the courage of the Ukrainian people standing bravely to defend their democracy, their way of life, and their futures. Let us show them that they are not alone, that the world stands behind them, that the United Nations has a purpose, that the additional bravery of the protesters in Russia is not in vain. Let us do everything, everything we can to help the people of Ukraine as they stand up for themselves, for their sovereign country, and for their children. Thank you. Thank you, I now give the floor to the representative of Albania. Dear colleagues, Albania voted in favor and welcomes the adoption of this resolution. Formally, this short text is of purely procedural nature, but its significance is of historic proportions. Last Friday, Evita tried to lock the UN at a time when we need it most. Not anymore. Those five lines of the text we just adopted open the big doors of the place where the world meets, the UN General Assembly, to speak out and condemn an unprovoked 
an unjustified pure act of aggression. The UNGA emergency session is all about condemning an unprovoked war. It is all about upholding the UN Charter. It is about ending a sending a clear and iron-strong message of what is accept acceptable and what is not, including to the Russian citizens who need to listen to the world and hear it. Russia must be stopped in its attempt to break the international rules-based order to replace it with its will. All member states, especially the small ones like mine, which constitute the majority of the UN, must remember that international law, rules, and the UN Charter are their best friend, their best army, their best defense, their best insurance. Russia's actions undermine them. It is time to learn from the past mistakes, not repeat and perpetuate them. Russia can, at any moment, come back to reason, stop the war, recall its invading troops, go back to talks, but real talks for peace, not for surrender and capitulation. But this needs lucidity, courage and wisdom, not threats for apocalypse. As we said last Friday, this is no time to stay idle or look away. It's time to stand up. Ukraine and Ukrainians are resisting. My steim i budem stayat z Ukrainie. Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor to the representative of France. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, on Friday, the Russian Federation was alone at the Security Council in blocking the adoption of a resolution that was co-sponsored by 80, uh, 82 members of the United Nations. They called for an end to the aggression of Ukraine. France cannot accept this block. For this reason, today, we voted in favor of this new resolution, which calls for a an emergency special session of the General Assembly. The Security Council remains seized of the matter. France will remain mobilized to that end to ensure that there be an upholding of its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. In this context, the President of the French Republic, Emmanuel Macron, uh, called for the Security Council to meet tomorrow to address the humanitarian situation in Ukraine, France will, alongside Mexico, submit a draft resolution in order to guarantee unfettered humanitarian access to meet the urgent needs of the people in Ukraine. Mr. President, in the light of those who are attempting to impose the law of the strongest, the international community has a duty to demonstrate its unity, its solidarity, and the primacy of rule of law. France stands steadfastly alongside Ukraine and its people. Thank you. Uh, I thank the representative of France, and I now give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Mr. President, Ireland once again strongly condemns the Russian Federation's further invasion of Ukraine, a sovereign and independent country. Since we last met on Friday, the Russian Federation has intensified its unjustified and unprovoked attack against Ukraine. Russia's aggression is causing mounting hardship and suffering for the people of Ukraine who have shown remarkable resilience and resolve. Ireland stands in full solidarity with them today. Mr. President, this Council has a responsibility to act in the face of conflict and to respond to this grave threat to international peace and security. We have failed to exercise that responsibility. We were rendered powerless to do so in spite of the clear will of 11 members of this council by the Russian Federation's use of the veto in a flagrant attempt to excuse its own military aggression against Ukraine, a fellow member of our United Nations. The use of this anachronistic veto 
in these terrible and tragic circumstances is reprehensible and undermines the legitimacy of this council in the eyes of the watching world. However, the veto will not prevent the international community from responding to Russia's blatant breaches of international law, nor will it deter us from holding Russia accountable for its actions. Ireland voted in favour of this draft resolution to decide to call an emergency special session of the General Assembly. Ireland calls on our fellow members of the General Assembly to step up where the Council has failed, to uphold the principles of the UN Charter, to condemn aggression and to support a return to the path of diplomacy and peace. This is the very least that the people of Ukraine deserve from us in their hour of need. We cannot let them down. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, President. Last Friday, the 25th of February, as a result of an exercise of the veto, the Security Council was unable to fulfill its primary responsibility of maintaining international peace and security. Since it proved unable to adopt a draft resolution in relation to the situation in Ukraine, despite 11 votes in favour. Before the paralysis of the Security Council, we are today invoking Resolution 377 Uniting for Peace to convene urgently an extraordinary session of the General Assembly. Since 1945, Mexico has maintained an unwavering stance against the exercise of the veto by permanent members of the Security Council. As we have maintained on numerous occasions and today reiterate, this faculty should not be a privilege. In all cases, it constitutes an enormous and very delicate responsibility. As a consequence, Mexico unreservedly supports the convening of the 11th Emergency Special Session of the General Assembly. And, as stated by the Permanent Representative of France, we will be convening a session to analyse the humanitarian situation prevailing on the ground and facilitating the expeditious arrival of assistance to those who most need it. Thank you very much, President. I now give the floor, thank you, to the representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, at present, we are witnessing dramatic changes in the Ukraine situation. China has on many occasions made its position clear on the Ukraine issue, and that position remains unchanged. We believe that the top priority now is for all parties to exercise the necessary restraint to prevent the situation in Ukraine from getting worse. China supports and encourages all diplomatic efforts conducive to a peaceful settlement of the Ukraine crisis and welcomes the earliest possible direct dialogue and negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. At the same time, China supports equal-footed dialogues between the EU and Russia on European security issues and upholding the principle of undivisible security to eventually form a balanced, effective and sustainable European security mechanism. China believes that the Security Council should give priority to regional peace and stability and the universal security of all countries and play a constructive role in resolving the Ukraine issue. Actions taken by the UN should help cool the situation and facilitate diplomatic solution to avoid escalation of tensions. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. President. 
the United Kingdom welcomes the result of this vote today. By voting in favour of convening an emergency special session of the General Assembly on Ukraine tomorrow, the members of this council have laid bare Russia's diplomatic impotence. Russia again was isolated in opposing this resolution. But Russia cannot stop the world from coming together to condemn its invasion of Ukraine. As each day passes in this unprovoked and unjustified war, support for the people of Ukraine, their plight and their fight for freedom grows. So we urge all members of the United Nations to use their voice tomorrow to call for the immediate withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukraine and end this war. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of India. Mr. President, it is regrettable that the situation in Ukraine has worsened further since the Council last convened on this matter. We reiterate our call for immediate cessation of violence and an end to all hostilities. There is no other choice but to return back to the path of diplomacy and dialogue. Our Prime Minister has advocated this strongly in his recent conversations with the leadership of the Russian Federation and Ukraine. In this regard, we welcome today's announcement by both sides to hold talks at the Belarus border. The global order is anchored on international law, UN Charter, and respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty of all states. We are all agreed on these principles. We continue to be deeply concerned about the safety and security of Indian nationals, including a large number of Indian students who are still stranded in Ukraine. Our evacuation efforts have been adversely impacted by the complex and uncertain situation at the border crossings. It is important to maintain an uninterrupted and predictable movement of people. It is an urgent humanitarian necessity that must be immediately addressed. Taking into consideration the totality of circumstances, we decided to abstain. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Norway. Norway voted in favor of the draft resolution. Just two days ago, in this chamber, we all saw that Russia was isolated and had no support for its attack on Ukraine. Russia's action is unacceptable. Russia is wrong. Russia is the aggressor that violates the very core principles of international law that the United Nations stands for. On Friday, this Council failed its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. The Council's response to the breach of the peace and the act of aggression failed because of the veto by the aggressor itself. Preventing such act is a direct responsibility of this Council. Therefore, it was necessary to reconvene today to decide to call an emergency special session of the General Assembly on this issue. Now we will take this matter to the General Assembly with the purpose of making appropriate recommendation to members for collective measures. Russia will be held accountable. The civilian population, including children, is suffering the consequences of this horrifying conflict, killings, displacement and disappearances, fighting in and around urban areas and the use of heavy explosive weapons, destruction of civilian infrastructure, we remain deeply concerned about the protected harm to the civilian population. Norway is on the side of the, of the Ukrainian people and its government. We are providing further assistance to Ukraine. The Norwegian government has today decided to provide 226 million US dollars in humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. 
Let me conclude by reiterating that Norway insists that the Russian Federation immediately, completely and unconditionally stops all fighting and withdraws all its forces from the territory of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, last Friday, my delegation laid out before the Council a comprehensive view of its concerns regarding the security developments in and around Ukraine. Nothing in the intervening period has led us to having had those concerns allayed. On the contrary, in fact, as we speak, the number of casualties, the human suffering, and the risks to international peace and security keep increasing by the hour. Indeed, UNHCR numbers recently uh, spread already place the number of refugees at 422,000. We have voted in favor of the draft resolution before the Council, despite misgivings about its timing and its contribution to achieving peace. These misgivings stem ultimately from our unyielding commitment of respect for and interest in upholding the Charter and the role of the Security Council. The urgency of the situation has convinced us of the need to add the voice of the General Assembly to that of the Security Council in seeking solutions to the crisis in and around Ukraine. This in no way detracts from our firm belief that the Council, with its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security, has not yet exhausted the instruments and mechanisms at its disposal to contribute to a negotiated and diplomatic solution towards peace. Therefore, we reiterate our call for an immediate cessation of hostilities, for full respect to humanitarian law, and for a renewed attempt within the Council for the promotion of, and support to, a process of dialogue between the parties involved, a role that the Council is inherently better equipped to provide in order to bring a peaceful solution to the Ukrainian conflict. The Security Council and the General Assembly must work together. As we renew our calls for an immediate ceasefire, we also appeal to Ukraine and Russia to facilitate the withdrawal of all persons who want to leave the Ukrainian territory. Brazil already wishes to express its gratitude to Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Moldova, Romania, and others who are facilitating the exit of people fleeing the conflict, in particular Brazilians and Latin Americans. Mr. President, let us be exceedingly cautious in moving forward in the General Assembly. The supply of weapons, the recourse to cyber attacks, and the application of selective sanctions, which could affect sectors such as fertilizers and wheat with a strong risk of famine, entail the risk of exacerbating the conflict and not of solving it. We cannot be oblivious to the fact that these measures enhance the risks of wider and direct confrontation between NATO and Russia. It is our duty, both in the Council and in the General Assembly, to stop and reverse this escalation. We need to engage in serious negotiations in good faith that could allow the restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity security guarantees for Ukraine and Russia, and strategic stability in Europe. I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to Gabon. Thank you, President. The Council is meeting this Sunday to try to echo the 
unequivocal messages of the international community against the war in Ukraine. As we have stated before this Council just two days ago, we reiterate our constant attachment to the founding principles of the Charter of the United Nations, which compel each one of its member states. We also have faith in the solidar in international solid solidarity and multilateralism. It is on behalf of these values which give our organisation and our charter its full relevance and nobility that we voted in favour of holding a special session of the General Assembly of the United Nations on Ukraine. Our thoughts today go to those innocent people who are suffering the horrors of a war that they have neither chosen nor provoked. These thousands of civilians who are fleeing their homes, their towns and their country to seek refuge elsewhere. My country is deeply concerned by the attacks against civilians and civilian public goods and calls for de-escalation. We call upon the belligerents to abstain from any use or threat of the use of weapons whose effects would be indiscriminate. Finally, Gabon continues to call for an immediate ceasefire and a resumption of frank, sincere dialogue. It is still time, it is always time, to choose dialogue and diplomacy over force. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the United Arab Emirates. Mr. President, the UAE regrets that the situation in Ukraine has worsened since our last meeting and reiterates its call for a cessation of hostilities. We remain steadfast in our belief that dialogue and diplomacy should be the only path to resolving differences. We therefore welcome today's news that talks may commence tomorrow morning on the Ukraine-Belarus border. This is urgent and much needed. We will work tirelessly to support efforts towards a peaceful resolution. As we conveyed on Friday, the developments in Ukraine undermine regional and international peace and security. The UAE reiterates that the protection of civilians in Ukraine is of the utmost importance, particularly as the security situation escalates. Civilians trying to reach safety must be able to leave unhindered. It is of paramount importance that necessary humanitarian aid is delivered to those in need. Space for humanitarian assistance must be preserved so humanitarian actors can maintain access to civilians. We empathize, we emphasize the importance of upholding international humanitarian law and mitigating the impact of this conflict on the most vulnerable. We reiterate once again the absolute need to uphold the principles of the UN Charter, in particular respect for the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of all member states. I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Mr. President, let me begin by acknowledging the dangerous moments we live in and noting the necessity for diplomacy to triumph over war. I therefore urge that even in this difficult moment and as diplomatic representatives of our states, we maintain the commitment of our states to dialogue and the objectives of peace. Last Friday, because of the exercise of the veto, this council was unable to assume its primary responsibility to act on a threat to international peace and security following the Russian Federation's aggression against Ukraine. It is time for the General Assembly to assume its residual responsibility and to pronounce itself on the matter. And it is for this reason that Ghana voted for this resolution just adopted. As we consider the resolution we have just adopted, 
it is important that we do so with sobriety, not only for this generation, but also for those whose blood and toil speak to us from the restless graves of the two world wars. As a condition for becoming a member of the United Nations, we have all declared to accept the obligations contained in the Charter in averment of our peace-loving nature. Today, the peace we say we love is threatened. Ghana therefore calls on all member states to participate in the emergency special session of the General Assembly in a constructive manner, to unite around the call for peace in stopping this unjustified war that has already caused the needless loss of many lives. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. I shall now deliver a statement in my capacity as a representative of the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation voted against the draft resolution submitted in connection with the fact that its sponsors proposed that it be registered that the Security Council fail to exercise its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. At the same time, we did not see even a hint at an attempt to reach a constructive solution at the Council. And yet, two days ago, we, we blocked a draft specifically for the reason that it was both one-sided and imbalanced. We have not seen any new initiatives since then. The UN and the United Nations Security Council were created in the post-war period with the aim of saving succeeding generations from the scourge of war. To that end, global powers reached, concurred to reach agreement among themselves, ideally to reach consensus. And in any event, certainly not to attempt to push through decisions on one another, nor to attempt to disregard the interests of any member of the P5. This is precisely why the Council has the vested right for permanent members to block a decision. This is not a privilege. This is a mechanism for ensuring the balance of interest, which is of such paramount importance for the entire world, and through this balance of interest for the achievement of global stability. Any attempt to circumvent the position of the Russian Federation, any attempt to disregard it undermines the very bedrock of the UN Charter. There is a need not to push through such schemes, but rather to endeavor to find common ground, regardless of our Western partners' attempts to avoid this including when they disregarded our legitimate concerns in connection with NATO's policy and uh, the Western uh, countries' violation of the core principles of the OSCE on the indivisibility of security. Now there's a need to focus on resolving the situation which precipitated the crisis with which we are grappling. This crisis broke out not as a result of the launch of the Russian special military operation in Ukraine, but much earlier, when for eight years you turned a blind eye to the crimes perpetrated by the Ukrainian nationalists in Donbass. And again, today, you did not mention at all the suffering of the residents of Donbass. For it was indeed uh, what was uh, dis uh, the the homes in Donbass, which, which was raised by uh, the Ukrainian armed uh, forces, and these images are now ta being taken by Western military outlets and being portrayed shamelessly as the consequences of our military operation in Ukraine. And today, during this meeting, once again, we hear lies, deceit, and fakes. Uh, about the indiscriminate shelling of Ukrainian uh, c cities, hospitals, and schools. The Russian army does not threaten civilians in Ukraine. It's not shelling civilian infrastructure. A threat to civilians is now posed by Ukrainian nationalists who have effectively seized as hostages the residents of Ukraine, and they are using them now as human shields. There is a multitude of, of evidence uh, from Ukrainians uh, that the nationalists, despite their protests, are taking heavy equipment, multiple rocket launchers, and, and deploying them in residential areas. This is an egregious violation of international humanitarian law, which needs to be duly condemned. Essentially, this is the same tactic that is being used by ISIL terrorists. 
all responsibility for the possible repercussions of uh, lies at the feet of the Maidan regime. The residents of Ukraine are also threatened by the uh, ongoing radicals uh, t uh, giving power to all of those who wish, including uh, prisoners from uh, escapees from jail. They are taking uh, weapons which are now being used by moraders, moraders and, and thieves and criminals. Social networks have sufficient evidence of this from the residents of Kiev and other cities that this demonstrates the reckless approach of the Ukrainian authorities vis-a-vis -vis their own citizens. Now, against the Russian Federation and social networks, there has been a, an information war has been unleashed. Insofar as evidence of destruction of civilian infrastructure by Russian military does not exist, Ukrainian strikes and uh, accidental strikes and uh, videos uh, from Donbass are being portrayed as such, and these are actually being carried out by the Ukrainian nationalists. Furthermore, social networks has a host of educational manuals about how to create fakes to depict uh, our military operations and fabrications, and, and these social networks have 1.2 million such fakes circulating. We urge our colleagues not to uh, aid and abet the proliferation of such disinformation, although I fear that once again the, this call will fall on deaf ears. I now resume my duties as the President of the Security Council and I give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Distinguished members of the Security Council, I would like to express my gratitude to those of you who have supported the request to call the UN General Assembly emergency session. I immediately express my regret that once again the Rule 20 of the Provisional Rules of the Security Council has not been properly applied by the Presidency. However, I express my relief that this rape of the Institute of the Presidency of the UN Security Council will be over in less than 48 hours. For those who appear to see no reason in supporting the request to have the emergency session. Despite my yesterday's letter sent to all of you, but the representative of the aggressor, I would like just to tell you the following. Do you know the most often warning now in the most of Ukrainian cities? Attention, air raids, please proceed to the shelters. And I do recommend you to look at the pictures and footages of what happened afterwards, day to day, night to night. I will continue to invite all members of the Security Council to join the catharsis, this purgation of this institution that will only save this institution for next generations. Russia persists in its aggression despite the initial plan of Blitzkrieg. And it failed, and we all see it. This failure prompted the bloody and mad Russian leadership to order heavy shellings of the residential areas critical infrastructure and storages of hazard materials in retaliation for Ukrainian resilience and resistance. It is extremely alarming that the Russian president has supported, has resorted today to open nuclear blackmail. The world must take this threat very seriously. Excellencies, now, the most intense fighting occurs around the Ukrainian capital, as well as in the northeast, Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernigiv, and in the south, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Mariupol. 
long-range operational and tactical aircraft, high-precision long-range weapons, multiple rocket launcher systems are widely used against the Ukrainians. Among the most telling recent examples of Russian course of action in Ukraine, missile strike on the town of Vasilki, which is practically is a suburb of the capital. A missile hit the oil depot, causing a large-scale fire. It was also shelling in Kharkiv that damaged the gas pipeline. According to the Ukrainian health minister, Viktor Plashko, at least 16 children were killed since 24 February 2022, when a large-scale military aggression against Ukraine was launched. On February, 6, on, on February 26, a seven-year-old girl who had been seriously wounded during the shelling of the kindergarten son in the city of Akhtirka died. On the same day, due to the shelling and gunshots, one child uh, was killed and two wounded in the National Children's Hospital Ahmadid in Kyiv. Due to threat of air raids, Maternity, uh, maternity hospitals in a number of Ukrainian cities, including Kyiv, Kharkiv, Sumy, Irpin, Bucha, to name just a few, could not operate normally. Ukrainian children are, bo are born in bomb shelters. According to the Ministry of Education of Ukraine, as of now, more than 350,000 school children have no access to education. 33 schools with over 5,500 students are closed due to severe insecurity in civil areas. Today I have brought these uh, appalling facts to the attention of the UNICEF, asking to respond immediately to the situation, give proper qualification to the actions of the Russian Federation and take all possible measures to stop further deaths and violence against children in Ukraine due to the blatant Russian aggression. I sent the, it by the diplomatic note, and I'm looking forward to work with the UNICEF on the issue. The losses of the enemy as early February 27 have amounted to nearly 4,300 personnel killed, and over 200 taken as prisoners of war. The detailed information is posted by the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. Distinguished members of the Security Council, as always, Russia denies that its soldiers are taken prisoners that is that taken prisoners uh, are recognized or the soldiers that are killed are recognized in this regard ukraine has opened a hotline entitled come back alive from ukraine for relatives of russian soldiers who are not aware of their whereabouts and cannot contact them. The hotline is opened by the government of Ukraine. Over 100 calls from Russian mothers were received during the first hour of its walk. It is unfortunate, however, that today, pursuant to the decision of the Prosecutor General of the Russian Federation. This, the line and the dedicated website has been shut down. So I want to use this opportunity to read the telephone number for anyone in Russia who would like to call and ask about the killed or taken prisoners or, or soldiers who are taken prisoners in Ukraine and in inquire about their well-being. It is 380-89-42-01-47. Again, 
86-0. We will distribute this information after the meeting, and I hope that after I read this number, the Russian Federation and its government would not shut down the website of the United Nations. We condemn that Belarus is being deeply engaged in the armed aggression against Ukraine. Since the beginning of the Russian aggression, this country has provided its territory for Russian offensive. Today, the Ukrainian city of Zhytomyr, in fact, the airport of Zhytomyr, was hit by Iskander missiles launched from the territory of Belarus. What an invitation for the negotiations at the border of Belarus. Or was it an escalation and raising stakes by the aggressor on the eve of the negotiations? Excellencies, Ukraine filed a case against the Russian Federation at the International Court of Justice. And the request for the court to issue an order of provisional measures against Russia. We will distribute this information, and very soon, if it's not already there, it will be available on the site of the court. Ukraine seeks an emergency hearing and an order by the court that Russia must cease its unlawful attack on Ukraine. Russia will have to answer for its behavior at the world court in the heart. The court has jurisdiction to hear Ukraine's case and to order emergency measures on the basis of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, so-called Genocide Convention. The Genocide Convention is one of the most important international treaties drafted in response to the horrors of the World War II and the Holocaust. Russia, however, has twisted the concept of genocide and perverted the solemn treaty obligation to prevent and punish genocide. It has made an absurd and unfounded claim of alleged genocide as a justification and pretext for its own aggression against Ukraine and violation of the sovereignty and human rights of the Ukrainian people. Ukraine's case before the ICJ will establish that Russia's aggression against Ukraine is based on a lie and a gross violation of international law and must be stopped. As the Ukrainian people continue to bravely stand against Russian aggression, Russia's lies will be exposed and Russia's contempt for international law will be confirmed. Ukraine will bring Russia to account. I will switch to Russian. To conclude, I wish to turn personally to the ambassador of the Russian Federation. During a previous meeting, I spoke about the children and their parents, parents who took pride of or were ashamed of the steps taken by their kin. It seemed to me at that point that you took my words very personally. I would be ready to take my words back if you were to follow the example of your colleague, Oleg Anisimov the head of the delegation of the Russian Federation and for the closure of in the intergovernment expert group on climate change, the intergovernmental panel on climate change. Today, in response to the, emo to the emotionally charged statement of the Ukrainian delegation, and it is difficult now to, for us to speak without emotion, he said, and I quote, that those who see what is taking place have, can find no justification for the attack against Ukraine, end of quote. This was delivered during the open part 
the closed part of the event, but it was confirmed by a number of participants and subsequently by Mr. Anisimov himself. There is always place in life for choices. There are always options. For example, one can remain a human being, a person, or they can continue to defend evil. And this is a choice which lies with every individual, always. I thank you. The list of speakers is closed. The meeting stands adjourned.